talk about the new industry. We all know that the developments taking place affect manufacturing as much as anything else. They affect the ways industries are organized. In this session, we have two speakers that come from completely different uh, sides of the industry, so to speak. One from a huge, big company and another from a very small company. And they will describe how the system of the industry is changing. We'd be delighted with our first speaker, who is the Director of Business Development at Bosch Software Innovation GmbH. Um, and that's a, a company that actually more or less termed the, the phrase Industry 4.0. And what our next speaker will describe is how are we going from this concept phase that we understand to real, really doing it. Please give a warm welcome to Dirk Slama. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, I was told I have about 18 minutes to talk about uh, going from concept to implementation industry 4.0. A quick question. How many people in this room do have a PhD in manufacturing execution systems? Okay, that's going to be tough in 18 minutes, but I'll give it a try. Um, Bosch, uh, not a small company, um, as you just learned. Um, if we would do a show of hand, most likely we would learn that some of you use our power tools, refrigerators, drive cars that have our components embedded, use um, smartphones that have uh, sensors embedded uh, that we produce. Um, and hello? Yes. Um, the big thing that, that we see at the moment is that um, all of these um, things are getting increasingly connected. So uh, smaller and smaller things are getting connected, and a lot of intelligence is put into these things. And what, what keeps us busy at night is what we call the Internet of Things. So in, in this um, massive distributed systems of systems, what we really see is that we have, for example, smart grids um, in houses and, and uh, so becoming intelligent, smart homes, uh, smart buildings, uh, etc. Um, there are a variety of uh, projections at the moment. So if, if you look at uh, Gartner.com or Cisco or, or GE, everybody's telling you that this is the big next thing after the internet is what we call the internet of things. So the connectivity of all kinds of things driven by the uh, ubiquity of um, wireless communication, by um, ever-increasing computational power. So today you get a Raspberry Pi for $20 that uh, 10 years ago would have cost you a fortune, and you can just embed it into new smart products, etc. So um, this is a um, really exciting time ahead. And one of the things uh, where we see this will have um, a big impact is how things are actually manufactured. So it's not only that the things that we manufacture become more and more intelligent and uh, connected, but it's also that the manufacturing process itself can really leverage these technologies and concepts. And we're actually talking about Industry 4.0, kind of like the fourth big revolution in manufacturing um, that we see starting today at the moment. And um, it's driven by um, the Internet of Things. Okay? Now, in manufacturing, uh, when you talk about Internet of Things, the first question that comes to mind is actually, what is a thing that you want to make intelligent, that you want to connect? Um, if we talk about a big robot, okay, it's a no-brainer. This thing costs uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, so the cost of putting um, a high-powered PC next to it, it's a no-brainer. But if you talk about a small screw, Okay, can you make the screw that you want to screw, for example, in, into the door, uh, to attach it to, to a car, intelligent? Most likely not. How about the car and the door that flows through the assembly line? Do you want to make this intelligent, right? Uh, these are the questions that, that keep us busy. And um, one of the key concepts that's uh, developed to, to manage all these things is what we call Cyber Physical Systems, or CPS. Okay, so a cyber physical system really gives these things an identity, 
gives these things the ability to, to, to learn about these things, to make these things uh, smart, okay? And here, again, for us, um, the question is, um, how do we deal with different things different sizes of things, things in different life cycles throughout the manufacturing uh, process, etc. cetera. Um, in order to help um, standardizing um, this development in Germany here, for example, we have the Architec, which is a non-governmental organization which is pushing these concepts of uh, Industry 4.0. And um, this is kind of like the big vision that we see. Um, it starts with what we call customer integrated engineering, okay? So uh, the idea being that, uh, for example, if one engineering company delivers something to another engineering company, take Formula One, okay? Uh, they want three very specifically engineered engines for the next season, okay? So we somehow have to embed their engineers into our production processes, okay? Create the alignment between these uh, two organizations and make sure that, that we can, uh, in a very efficient way, um, integrate their requirements, okay? So this requires what we call the resilient factory, okay? So we need to be very flexible. We need to be able to deal with um, ever smaller batch sizes, okay, so the, the, the buzzword at the moment is batch size one, okay, so you go to my favorite sneaker vendor.com and you say, okay, I want to have a pair of sneakers with um, a picture of Cookie Monster from Sesame Street to it, okay, and they will produce exactly one pair of these sneakers for you. Does this mean, in this case, that they will have to change the assembly line to do this? No, in the last example, maybe not, but in the first example, okay, if you produce highly specialized engines, then yes, most likely for these three engines, you will have to change the assembly line. And that basically means that you somehow need to make the assembly line more flexible, more intelligent, you need to network your production. Um, you want to also um, deploy advanced concepts like predictive maintenance. So the whole idea is that even before a problem occurs, we will learn about the likelihood that this problem is occurring. So we are producing, we use, for example, hydraulic components. We apply something that we call hydraulic um, or liquid analysis, okay, telling us uh, if something in the consistency of the liquids is changing. And that basically mapped against the big data profile gives us the capability to basically predict when this machine part most likely is gonna uh, fall apart, okay, so that we can schedule um, a call with a server or, or an appointment with a service technician at the right point in time and preventing this uh, from happening. Uh, next thing, technology marketplace, uh, also very interesting. Uh, if batch sizes are getting smaller and smaller and the products that we produce get uh, more and more specialized, then of course we need the ability in the network to source things. And the things that at the end of the day we need to source typically these days are more and more software. Okay? So I want to have a marketplace, for example, where I can go and for this particular uh, order that I have to fulfill, I want to basically find the CNC control software in the marketplace and upload it. Um, and then at the end of the, of the day, of course, also adaptive logistics. We need to be more and more flexible uh, to handle um, all of this. Okay. Um, let me give you a couple of very concrete examples because some of the stuff, um, given that none of us is a PhD in this, might be sometimes a little bit abstract. So let's use concrete examples. Um, the first example is from the area of uh, spare parts replenishment. This might look simple, but um, so from my own experience, um, we just moved into a house and I'm just building a new terrace. And last weekend, I was out of screws. So that meant I have to take my car, go to the Bauhaus, right, uh, buy the right screws, drive back, and then I can continue working. It cost me one hour of time where my production stopped. Okay, so it was not so bad because, you know, I had coffee on the way, et cetera, et cetera. But if this happens on the grand scale, okay, if a full factory is stopped because a small part is missing, then, of course, we're talking about um, different uh, costs, okay, so we need to avoid this. 
And um, for this, we want to apply this concept I was talking about earlier on. We want to make a connection between the real world, okay, so this uh, spare part box, and the virtual world, i.e. I want to have a central place where I can find out where am I in terms of uh, replenishment of all of my different components. And um, what you see in um, traditional environments is that you have boxes, okay? Maybe in a more advanced uh, environment, this is already somehow controlled by a Kanban cycle, etc. But what we see in the next generation is that these boxes now are starting to be equipped with um, sensors, okay? A sensor that can basically, first of all, help me to locate this box, okay, to find the right box with the right screws in it. Um, maybe also measure the weight of the things in the box, okay, um, to tell me when I'm running out of this particular type of screws so that I can then basically trigger the replenishment uh, process. And that's how we, for example, um, attach intelligence and logic to small things, okay? So I would call this a cyber physical system in the sense of CPS as def defined earlier on. Um, the next thing, of course, is um, RFID, okay? So um, it's not a new technology, it's been around for a while, and we know that um, it's not easy, okay? But uh, we're now at Bosch um, using uh, RFID technology to track millions um, of um, products in the production cycle, starting with the um, supply chain, okay? Monitoring uh, things in the supply chain, up to, for example, um, internal milk runs, etc. Um, we also use this concept of RFID to implement what we call the product memory. Okay, so the idea here is that um, at the moment in most factories, the assembly line is called by a central system, an ERP slash MES slash MOM system. And every time I need to change something in the way how I assemble things, that's a problem because it also means I have to reprogram the central system. So what people really want is more flexibility, batch size one, okay? Um, so they want more intelligent manufacturing modules, okay? Um, An RFID for us is one way of achieving this. So uh, what you can see here on this slide, it's an example from the Hanover Fair uh, earlier this year by our Rexroth division, uh, which produces drive and control components. Okay? And here you can see uh, snapshots of an assembly line where each module in the assembly line is basically reading from the product via an RFI chip what this product is, what the configuration of this product is, and what should be done to the product. And then the production module can locally basically um, decide what should be done, okay? Also update the RFID chip on the product, okay? With the information about what has been done, and then basically allow the product to move on to the next module in the production line. And that, we believe, in the future will greatly decouple the whole way how uh, all of the different components in the factory interact with each other. In fact, um, at the same Hanover Fair, there was um, another example from the DFKI, uh, which is the German Institute for Artificial Intelligence, so you would expect smart things to come from them. They um, set up um, a, uh, an alliance called the Smart Factory Alliance, uh, which we are a member of. And the goal really is to implement all of these concepts. So what you can see here is um, a set of different production modules. Each of these production modules is integrated with the next in line through um, a specialized interface. It's a door between these uh, production modules through which the products pass, okay? And again, very similar concept, each product has an RFID chip on it that has information about what should be done next, okay? So each module in this production line can act independently, okay? And that's why in this particular setting at the Hanover Fair, they were able to demonstrate how on the fly, 
well, it still took them two hours, but I thought it was pretty impressive, change, for example, the order of these production modules, okay, to basically enable a different type of product, for example, okay? So you can imagine when we talk about smaller and smaller and more specialized batch sizes, this becomes increasingly important. Um, Another thing um, that we see at the moment is that, for example, um, tightening tools are becoming more and more intelligent. Uh, so in this picture, for example, you can see uh, the most high-end uh, tightening tool from uh, Rexrod. It's the uh, Nexo. Okay? Um, and what makes it so special is that it has uh, built in a uh, full-size uh, Linux computer, actually real-time Linux, okay, which is running the processes which are controlling the tightening. Okay? And that is very important uh, to our customers because this really helps um, not only improving the tightening process itself, but also, for example, uh, the quality control. So we can basically, you see this in the lower right corner, now create an, a precise profile of all the tightening processes. So we can record the torque, the angle, uh, etc., for every screw that was tightened, okay? So if you imagine um, the cost, for example, for recalling products that uh, you would have if there was a problem in your production process versus the ability to really, in a very fine granular way, uh, basically trace everything you have done in uh, the production. So instead of having to recall, let's say, three million products, you only have to recall three products because you know exactly it was only three products that had a problem with the production process. In this particular case, that's a massive step uh, forward. Okay. Um, the vision goes even uh, further. Okay. So um, in this case, you see an example um, for um, a concept that basically says, okay, why not take um, the um, the uh, manufacturing bill of material on the one side, or the uh, typically three-dimensional model that lies behind this, okay, and trace this in real time. So have the real product, the car or the wing of, of the airplane, uh, located in the assembly uh, hall, okay, using um, indoor uh, positioning information use the same indoor positioning information with the tightening tools, okay, so that I can get precise information about uh, at which location relative to the product the tightening process has happened, okay, basically giving me uh, very precise information about what happened in my production um, environment, okay. Um, on the next slide. You can see um, another example um, that's actually, uh, again, from the Hanover Fair. I thought it was very impressive. Um, on the left side, you can see an actual production line, the car moving through the production line. And then uh, in front, you basically see the PLM system, which has a three-dimensional model of the assembly line, of all the robots in it, and of the product moving through it. And you could really see how, in real time, using an OPC link, um, the uh, 3D model of the production line was updated to reflect reality, to reflect what was happening on the real um, manufacturing line. So, this is advanced technology. This may be not so much. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, in order for all of this to happen, this is not going to happen overnight, okay? Um, what needs to happen, of course, is that the component suppliers, the machine builders, the factory operators, the OEMs, etc., all start um, adopting these concepts. What we be really believe is that um, from field data to production models, at the end of the day, a big role behind this is uh, business processes tying these things together. This is something that uh, our division actually is also focusing on. And um, also, um, to uh, maybe finish this off in time, <laughs> Just to give you an outlook, we believe um, that over the next 10, 15 years, this is going to be one of the most exciting uh, places in, in, in the internet economy to, to be in. I mean, if you look at what happened um, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, okay, a lot of companies fundamentally had to change their business models or actually were wiped out by 
changing business models because they didn't um, adopt fast enough, etc. This, up until now, has not been true for the larger manufacturers, but what we see happening at the moment is that all of these concepts are now also really making their way into modern manufacturing, not only enabling exciting new products, but also really changing the way how we produce things in the future. And um, given that this is a startup conference, I would really encourage um, all of the people here who are working with a startup background to come to us, talk to us. Uh, we believe this is a very exciting uh, field ahead. And maybe um, also an interesting uh, point to hand over to the next speaker who will talk about um, actually the production of uh, fair phones. So maybe we can create a link between those, these two presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's amazing that we have the full lecture compressed into a very short space. There's a very big story, and it's also about huge companies and conglomerates of companies um, changing the whole process of how they work together and what gets produced, basically. Do you see this as a really open platform? You mentioned the startups, but it sounds like you can only do this when you're really big. <laughs> I actually do believe um, that you need both. Um, sometimes you need scale. Um, sometimes it's also good to be small on, and innovative. So, for example, our division is called Innovation uh, mm -hmm. because <laughs> our CEO really wanted us to be uh, small and nimble. Um, and for us, it's been working out great. We see ourselves more as a startup in the larger uh, group, and we okay. behave like this, and we do work with large partners and customers, but we also do work with uh, small startups. And I think it's an exciting uh, space to bring these things together. And within Europe, I think um, Germany is a very good name for manufacturing and, and innovation in manufacturing. Is the same thing happening in China? Or are they also looking at this in this way? Or is it a completely different type of development? I mean, what other areas in the yeah. world are you know, thinking of manufacturing in this complete rethinking right. of manufacturing. Oh, I think there's a lot of um, excitement about this in, 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 in Asia Pacific as well. So we, we saw, for example, uh, one of the big Internet of Things conferences was uh, hosted um, in, in Wuxi in China last of year. Course, so because, because they have um, so yes, much manufacturing. Big excitement. Yeah. But also, um, what we really see at the moment is um, a lot of excitement about this in um, the United States of America. I think that um, they are fundamentally rethinking uh, their positioning in, in this space for the next decade, and I think that they see a lot of value. Uh, in, the, in the future to also have uh, manufacturing locally again. Yeah. So manufacturing has to be smart and then it can also be pulled back to local... I think so, yes. Uh, to the Western world, basically. Thank you very much. Thank you.